marketers will all glom on to any tactic that works in volumes that will eventually ruin it. Yeah. We re ruin everything. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, great. Maybe, maybe like right now, direct mail is working pretty well. Yeah. You know, um, everybody else is going to start doing direct mail. And the next thing we know, it's we're going to be like anymore. overwhelmed and we're going to have to yeah. find something else. Yeah. Um, I, so that's why I ultimately come back to the most important thing is that getting that sales and marketing team dynamic working, mm -hmm. you know, so that way you can actually reach out to people with a human touch, maybe say something personalized and relevant, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, you'll figure out the channel to do that. Ignition sequence start. Three, two, one. Boom. John Miller. Thanks for being on the show, man. Howdy. Um, so CEO, founder of Engageo, previously founder of Marketo. Um, you've been doing this now, I mean, SaaS, what, 2005-ish? Yeah, Maybe. we started uh, Marketo, kind of started talking about it late 05, and then really started things up and running in 2006. That was coming off of seven years of Epiphany. Uh, which was a non-SaaS company, but yeah. was still in the MarTech space. And what did they call it ASP back then? What was it called? Was it called SaaS, like subscription as a service, or was it application service? Oh, well, I mean, by 2006, it was SaaS. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, but before at, at, at Epiphany, you know, we were this on-premise vendor who had ASP partners for oh, people true, who yeah. wanted to use the software, you know, in a host environment. Yeah, but by the time 2000, Marketo came up and running, uh, we actually didn't make a big deal of about the fact that we were a SaaS solution. Okay. You know, it was sort of almost common enough, mm -hmm. you know, that, that uh, like, no, of course that's how you would deliver a solution. These and days. where did, I mean, where did that idea for Marketo come from? Like, what's the origin story? And then obviously, as you parlay into the ABM space with Engageo, how, like, yeah. it, how do you see <clears throat> these opportunities in the markets? Like, starting with Marketo, we'll get into Engageo, like, well, I mean, the, the broader arc is, you know, my whole career is marketing technology. So mm -hmm. Epiphany, uh, even before Epiphany, before business school, I was associated with a company called Exchange, which is part of the leading marketing tech of like the mid 90s. It was an ad platform or what's? No, no, no. It just, it was the first campaign management tool. Okay. Really. Uh, part of the reason I got the job at Epiphany as like a guy with no tech experience was because uh, they were going to enter in the market to compete against Exchange. Okay. You know, it's like, oh, hey, you know something about this. Yeah, great. Come do it here. Um, so the theme of all these companies is, you know, really been pursuing this this vision of of truly one to one marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we use all this data and analytics that are available to just make marketing better, right? So that's not spam people want to avoid, but actually meaningful and relevant. So that's sort of what I've been inspiring to all along. Yeah. You know, when we when so Epiphany got sold. Uh, at the around mid uh, 2005, okay, uh, and that's when Phil Fernandez and I started talking, uh, and you know we we believed in this vision. We both believed in this vision of like this sort of future, you know, marketing technology, but we'd also seen the challenges that Epiphany and the other companies had, which is you know enterprise software two hundred fifty thousand dollar price points and up, mm -hmm. you know that that was hard for marketers to buy. They just I mean, didn't have the budget. <clears throat> Yeah, marketers have big operating budgets. Yeah. But nobody likes putting CapEx investment into what they often see as a cost center. Yeah. And so the real just idea for Marketo was let's build you know enterprise powerful marketing software that we can deliver through so software as a service that would let us um, basically make the software as easy to buy for the marketer as buying Google AdWords was. Okay. You know, and so it was a, it, the idea was a business model more yeah. than and what was the initial price point you know, then any to make specific that feature well so just thing about marketo is our very first product was a tool to help with pay-per-click um, advertising and sort of bid optimization tied into the landing pages okay and the goal was when we wanted it to be really easy to buy so you could buy this thing self-service on a credit card uh, and then get up and, you know, and basically we were just taking 5% of whatever you spent. Yeah. So I think, you know, it was goofy. We had customers who we were earning like 21 cents from, uh, which performance. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, so we got, we got up and running with that product and frankly, it wasn't particularly successful. It was okay. Mm -hmm. Um, good. Gave us sort of some operational experience. And, but through that time, 
we then built the product that eventually became our marketing automation product mm -hmm. um, and made some hard decisions. Let's like, let's drop the pay-per-click product because uh, it wasn't working that well. Bit, let's yeah. really focus on this new thing. And what was the product hook for Marketo in the early days? Was it understanding the, the, the journey of the potential buyer on the website? Because I mean, I feel like that was a really innovative, like understanding if they showed up on the website and what activities they did and then customizing campaigns from that. Was that early days? Of yeah, Marketo? that was, yeah. I mean, definitely part of it was kind of tying the, the digital behaviors to the ability to kind of, you know, take action. Um, the, the, the real core problem was, you know, gosh, 2005, 2006. Remember, Google AdWords was only about three years old. Yeah. So what was happening at the time was marketers were really for the first time generating online leads that scale. Mm. And, and what they really needed was a place to capture those leads, you know, and they needed a place to do something with them, Nurture like them. store them somewhere. Yeah. And then what do they do with the ones that aren't ready for sales? You know, then in this case, they had to nurture them and develop them and score them so they could know when to pass to sales. Yeah. So that was the business problem that kind of we were solving with that early kind of Marketo solution. As, as I said, we sort of dropped the self-service. We actually raised the price point. Yeah. Um, and actually made it a lot more successful, um, you know, because it was stickier. It made it a little harder to buy. It made it, people had to be a little bit more committed to it. Yeah. Uh, to kind of be successful. And that's, and then Marketo, frankly, took off from there. I mean, it was just got the right business model with a good product that worked uh, and a good category that was growing. And then. I think we executed the marketing sales pretty well. Did you um, have yeah. a hard time picking the right customer segment, kind of the ideal customer profile in the early days? Did you go pretty broad? How did you figure that part out? In the early days of Marketo, yeah. uh, it was relatively straightforward because we had an advantage at the time there was this company, Eloqua. Yeah. You know, and Eloqua was probably the leading marketing automation platform. Okay, I wasn't sure who came out first. Yeah, they were, they, you know, they were Canadian. first. Yeah. Yeah, so like we're talking like kind of 2008 now, okay. two, you know, 2009. Yeah. You know, Elk was definitely a bigger company than Marketo, and they had done a pretty good job, especially in sort of Sand Hill Road and the Silicon Valley community, kind of convincing people that you need something like this. Yeah. And the problem with Elk was that it was pretty complicated, pretty expensive. It was SaaS, but it was relatively long implementations. Mm -hmm. So when we came along with something that, remember, our DNA had been, let's yeah, make it really fast and easy. Yeah. And even though we sort of took away the self-serve, we had all the kind of ease of use that we put into it to enable yeah. that. Yeah. You know, compare that to then Eloqua, which is, you know, people. Configuration. Which thought it was yeah. hard. So we were like, wow, it's just as powerful or almost as powerful, Easy but it's use. a lot, you know, easier to use and more affordable. And so we were able to just really go in and sell to, frankly, the category they had helped to create. Yeah. And then once we got some scale, now that we're kind of co-creating the category together and we sort of crossed the chasm, got out of just venture back tech and started to grow. Yeah. But having Elko there really helped. Yeah. So they kind of like, I feel like every SaaS company owes Salesforce, you know, because they kind of set the whole even concept of like, hey, let's put stuff in the cloud. Like yeah. their marketing dollar enabled us to be able to build the companies we built totally. today. We didn't even have to claim that was SaaS is a great benefit because just, yeah, of course. Yeah. There's just a better model. Mm -hmm. um, so you did Marketo. And then uh, what did you learn growing that company as a founder? Like what are some, if you had to say like, these are the three big things that I learned, you know, in that journey about yourself or some of the skill sets you had to develop, what, what would those be? Um, well, one, you know, we, I think Marketo was successful despite its culture as opposed to because of its culture. Okay. Um, Phil and I didn't even spend one minute talking about values and culture when we were founding the company. Mm -hmm. We talked about product and strategy and all those types of things. We didn't even codify the core values till we were about $30 million. Wow. Um, and as a result, you know, we ended up with a sort of fragmented culture. It, was, it, it wasn't, I don't think anybody would say like, oh my God, Marketo was like, such an awesome place to work. Was we were product market fit that enabled the growth? We were winning because yeah. great product market fit, good product, good execution. Uh, Phil certainly drove the team, you know, hard. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so people were generally happy because winning People like good. to win, yeah. You know, but it, was, it wasn't a great place to work. So that's okay. one thing I sort of like, I wanted to bring to engage you a much more intentional thought uh, about building culture. Yeah. Um, I sort of alluded to kind of the whole, you know, sometimes actually putting some friction into the process uh, can help. <laughs> yeah. Because you know, the real problem with marketing technology is there's so many options out there for the marketer. Yeah. It's like they're kids in, can in, the, in the candy store. Like, yeah. And everybody's like, I've got the solution to help you solve pipeline. I've got the solution to help you solve your problems. And if it's really easy to, to buy, people are like, sure, I'll try it. I'll try that. I'll try that. You're like, oh, yeah, no problem. 
Yeah. Right. But they're it's also going to be sticky. Quick. Yeah. It's hard to get sticky. Yeah. Um, and actually like, no, no, no. Like you actually have to commit to wanting this thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then they put the energy in to really be successful. Yeah. You know, can, can help. I think the third lesson is probably a pretty good segue into engagement. They didn't have cus- did you guys call customer success back then? No. No. No, no. It was just needed renewals. Yeah, yeah. It's like <laughs> revenue retention. It's like, yeah, I like to keep the customer. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, we you know, we didn't build we had um yeah, I mean I I think we had like A C S M at some when we had yeah. like forty million in revenue or something. Yeah. You know, like to help with the enterprise guys. Yeah. Um so I think the third lesson kind of, you know, evolved over the years doing marketing, you know, because because it started with this whole vision of generate a lead, nurture it till it's ready, pass it to sales. Yeah. And it works really well, especially kind of at the lower ACVs. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as as Marketo got bigger, you know, th- th- that, that engine sort of only took us so far. Yeah. You know, effectively, and we needed. And what breaks at that level? I mean, what did you guys see in regards to like the lower ACV is interesting, lead scoring, et cetera, kick it off. But then you're saying at a mid market or enterprise, well, a couple things. You know, one, you reach the point where you know <clears throat> doubling the number of blog posts you write yeah. isn't going to double the amount of pipeline you create, mm. right? And goals are high. And like you know, it's like okay, I can't just keep doing more of the same thing. Yeah, you know, I need a different engine. The other one is. You know, I always use this fishing analogy. You know, you're fishing. We were fishing with nets. Yeah. We put our stuff out there, and we didn't care who responded. We just cared did we catch enough. Yeah. Right. But the problem is, you catch a lot of small guys mm-hmm. with nets, and the economics for going after bigger companies is usually better. Yeah. Um. You know, you can have three times the deal with only thirty percent longer sales cycle mm-hmm. type of thing. So, yeah, you know, but you just you don't naturally catch those big fish in your net. You got to kind of you have to go, out there go after and... them with a spear. Yeah. Um, and so what started to happen was sort of a breakdown of the kind of traditional marketing and sales model. Yeah. You know, of like the baton. It wasn't a baton handoff anymore. Yeah. Like, no, we're going to pick these big accounts. Named accounts. And we're going to go after them. And you're not going to go after them just by marketing, doing the same stuff we've always been doing. Yeah. Better analogy. And you learned this at Marketo. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, better analogy was that it was kind of more like a soccer team. Mm-hmm. You know, marketing was in its position, sales was in its position, but we had to work past the ball back and forth yeah. as we kind of moved the ball down the field. Yeah. Um, and and that different dynamic, and, and frankly, the challenge of trying to do that kind of dynamic with Marketo as my platform, yeah. is what made me realize it was an opportunity for kind of a new solution. Now, what change in the market? So obviously inbound, you know, content marketing really took off. Obviously marketing, having a seat at the revenue table yep. and, you know, that stuff is all all fairly, you know, even, even uh, RevOps as a thing, like these are all like new things lately, but like, what did you see change in the way that either companies were buying that made you realize like an ABM or an Engageo platform was, was ready. Cause I mean, we could be early and wrong and yeah. you know, we could miss the market and be late. How did, what, what did you see that made you feel like that was the right timing? Well, it's a little bit of something of what I just said. I mean, there's, there's this whole thing. People talk about content shock and, you know, peak content, yeah. you know, and different, different phrases of just describing what I said. It was like saturated. I just can't, yeah grow it just doesn't work as well as it used to mm-hmm. I, I need to do something else yeah I, I think that's one I think that um, you know I mean, GDPR obviously happened later but there were other privacy regulations you know that were hitting and so you had some dynamic where it was harder for marketing to kind of just do this let me just get a list of people and then I'll start emailing them you know that that kind of went away for marketers. But what happened was then you had tools like Outreach and Sales Loft come on the scene. And all of a sudden now, marketers weren't the only people who had the ability to email anymore. Salespeople had their own ability to email. And frankly, they didn't want marketing doing it anymore. Yeah. And so the role of marketing at the top of the funnel. Yeah, for demand you know, gen. Like the only people who can send email and the only people who could work at the top of the funnel went away. That's interesting. You know, and marketers kind of It's had true. To- Sales didn't do that before. Like- they didn't, they were not at scale. No. I mean, like before Marquette, yeah, they had enterprise. Yeah. They'd go out and try to get these whales or big accounts, but right. they didn't have like 
the have, tools to do to, this at to any kind of you know scale or whatever. So that changed the role of marketing. Mm. Um, you know, obviously buying committees are getting bigger. Everybody knows that. Yeah. Right. The implication of that though is that you know now if there's 16 people involved in a decision, wow, what are the chances that any sales rep is really having one-to-one -one conversations with all 16? It's pretty low. Very low. And so, but marketing is the function that's pretty good at talking to mass. Yeah. You know, and so the best marketers are starting to think about how, all right, I have less of a role at the front of the funnel. How can I actually play a bigger role later in the funnel, mm -hmm. you know, while sales is already engaged? Yeah. You know, by accelerating the deal and, you know, that kind of thing, which is just back to the soccer ball analogy. Like, yeah, closer to the it's ball. not a handoff anymore. It's yeah. you're working together. And I think the third big change is, um, you know, through SaaS and everything we were talking about, most companies make their revenue today off of recurring revenue models. Mm -hmm. You know, and expansion has become more important than ever. Yeah. As a result, most companies make most of their revenue after the initial sale. Yeah. The whole Marketo baton handoff, generate a lead model is totally focused on new business. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think most marketing departments they look at today are still overly focused Acquisition. On acquisition in yeah. your business, but that's not the reality of revenue. Rev yeah. The revenue is happening after the sale. Retention, yeah, you know, and Expansion. and so those are the, just to sum it up. You know, you have marketing spending less time at the front of the funnel, sales spending more. Yeah, marketing spending more time late in the sales cycle. Yeah, you know, to help accelerate deals, marketing should be spending more time post sale to yeah. both expand and retain accounts. Mm -hmm. Collectively, those are the key forces that I think drove kind of this new model mm -hmm. for kind of how sales and marketing teams need to operate. That's crazy. So what? So when you start thinking of a platform for Engageo, what was the first product features that you kind of put together? Sure. Like what yeah. was the, yeah? What did the MVP look like? Well, so remember the in, in many ways, my north star hasn't changed. Yeah. I want to build that platform for true one to one. Marketing At that scale. makes every interaction more personalized, you know, more custom, intelligent. Yeah. That, now I'm willing to focus that on B two B, but yeah, but that's sort of the north star. Yeah, uh, and I just want to engage you to be, you know, frankly, the next generation of that kind of same sequence. Yeah, you know, in order to do that, the the most fundamental thing you need, you know, is the proverbial single view of the customer. Yeah, three sixty you know, view. You gotta, you know, and 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 the ABM. The challenge was especially in this B2B account-based world, you have you had a, a complete view of the lead sitting in Marketo, mm -hmm. but nothing about the account. You had data about the account sitting in Salesforce, mm -hmm. right? But because of this goofy way Salesforce works, the leads didn't tie to the accounts. No. So you had a disconnect there. You had you know, your website and your tools like Leadlander that could tell you through reverse IP lookup which companies were visiting the website, but that didn't tie to anything else. And then you have, you know, your email and your calendar, right? And e reps are emailing people and communicating, now setting up, logged. setting up meetings. And as you just said, they never log their stuff. Nothing, you know. And nobody's ever succeeded in figuring out how to make them do it. So that's its own kind of silo. So the first, you know, engage your MVP on this journey towards building this like next gen platform yeah. is let's just solve that problem. <laughs> let's let's take all, all the in. data from these disparate sources, um, match it to the right account, yeah. normalize it um, so you can make sense of it. And we did that using the concept of time. Um, but what we realized is, you know, like a webinar attendee, that's 30 minutes. Yeah. Somebody who downloads or visits your website, that's just maybe one minute. Yeah. Somebody who comes to a dinner, that's two so hours. So quantify engagement. Yeah, you know, so we use, sort of use time as a proxy. So yeah. single view of, of the account, normalize it through time. And then we basically made the insights that, that generated insights that we would then make available to marketing and to sales. Okay. Right. The marketers could really start to understand things like, hey, when I do this marketing activity, do I create more engagement with the people that matter? Yeah. Salespeople could know, hey, what the hell is even happening in marketing at the, you know, for the accounts I care about, what's happening? Yeah. What marketing. are they, what messages are they pushing in these accounts? Yeah. How are they influencing yeah. my conversations? Like, what did they consume so that when I get on this next call? Exactly. And it's, it's again, it's this weird, goofy Salesforce problem. Yeah. They're looking at accounts. All the marketing activity is tied to the leads. So the, there was no way for them to even just see what marketing was happening at the accounts that they cared about. Yeah. And so we solved that problem, you know, initially. 
um, and hit product market fit on that pretty fast. Like within six months? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we started in, I started in, in uh, on Pi Day. Yeah. So we started on March 14, 2015. Yeah. So 31415. Yeah. Uh, we had our first beta customer in July. Okay. And we had our first paying customer in November. That's so amazing. Yeah. It was really fast. And what is it that you've, um, obviously culture you're taking, I'm assuming into Engageo this time, create, you know, making that more thoughtful up front. Um, from an innovation point of view, like how do you guys, cause I know you guys use your own product cause a lot of the content you guys write about some of your case studies. What are some of the things that you've done? with your product that are kind of unique around ABM? Like, I'm assuming you guys were using your own product right yeah. from the beginning to get these accounts. What were some of those campaigns? Well, even before I get to the campaigns, I'll talk a little bit about how we kind of measured everything. Because mm -hmm. um, you got to know what's working in order to yeah, kind of improve. improve. Um, so one of the things we've done is we've defined um, an account journey. So, you know, classically, salespeople have sales funnels. Yeah. Right? And why do they do that? It's so that they can understand, well, if the account is in this stage, then it has 30% likelihood to close. Yeah. And here's the things I need to do to move it forward. Yeah. Dot, 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 dot. Yeah. We basically took the same thing. We just extended it all the way back to the very top. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, accounts that are cold. Yeah. Right. Accounts that we uh, have targeted and are, have never done anything with us, but are showing intent off of third party systems. Yeah. Accounts that are slightly aware, accounts that are have at least one engaged target with us, mm. you know, dot, you know, the, and then actually an interesting stage after that was the a stage that we call a marketing qualified account mm -hmm. or an MQA. Okay. Which is really playing off the classic thing that a lot of marketers have been doing, which are MQLs. Yeah. Or marketing qualified leads. Yeah. So we sort of, no, 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 it's not about the MQLs, it's about the MQA. Okay, yeah. So we have that stage and we have the meeting stage and then the opportunity early stage opportunity, late stage opportunity. Yeah. So we d we've mapped out that whole journey. And then for each territory, we know where all the accounts are. Yeah. For our target accounts, our tier one, our tier two, our tier three, we know where all those accounts are uh, kind of against that stage. The amount of data that's available today <clears throat> is just ridiculous. Like, I mean, you can, the third party stuff you talked about, like, you know, I, 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 yeah, just I've been told you can like, you know, essentially monitor search terms within an organization Sort of. I mean, like the, there's the, some the way just, the yeah. way it mostly works is um, with the intent is um, well. So so very one way is like if you let's say you you can go to G two Crowd mm -hmm. or G two yeah right they know who is reviewing your category yeah right and they can tell you based on IP or yeah. whatever yeah or or registered user yeah you know um, or who's looking at your competitors so that's a very explicit way of figuring out intent and they yeah. can sell that to you a more subtle one is. Um, if you're a publisher, uh, and you have access to all these content sites, mm -hmm. you know, now what you can do is reverse IP lookup. Hey, somebody from HP is on a page about th with this article. You do semantic processing to figure out what that page is about. Like, oh, yeah. hey, people from HP are looking at security software. Yeah. Right. And when you start to see enough of a trend, you can kind of say, sell that as kind of an intent surge. And that gets... <clears throat> in your model that you mapped out that gets kind of elevated to for maybe, us that's you know. that's further than a cold account yeah um now it's not somebody who's engaging with us necessarily yet mm -hmm. right so once we have these stages defined you know what we then can start to do is figure out what are the plays that we want to run against accounts in each stage so if an account is you know so we have an integration to like linkedin mm -hmm. Right. So if, if an account shows is goes to that cert intent stage for us, but it hasn't done anything with us, we might start turn we might turn on yes. ads in LinkedIn. So essentially each stage has a play that you guys have defined, could be a sequence of steps that you feel like at this stage let's execute this, ideally through automation. Yeah. That's where we get the scale. Start to get some scale. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the plays end up combining um, marketing and human touches from sales. Yeah. So if something gets a little bit further along, we might send a package yeah. to the CMO, uh, personalize it, custom node and all yeah. that kind of thing. And then as soon as that package is delivered, that triggers something. We use outreach. So it triggers a Need sequence it. for the SDR to kind of follow up with that person. Deliver it and somebody signs for the package. So you're tracking the shipping. I mean, this is really cool because you can create these like really elaborate experiences for the, the account. And based on all these different data points, you can customize, you yeah. know, 
the touch points. Yeah. Now the magic actually is slowing things down. Yeah. You know, because you can automate. So you that. don't want to be over. You don't want to overwhelm somebody. <laughs> you, yeah. can, you yeah. can. You can automate the hell out of stuff, and you could do. You could. You could send the same package to five hundred accounts with the same generic email follow up. Yeah. Maybe you get seven or eight percent response rate. Yeah. Slow that whole thing down. Customize each package based yeah. on a little bit of. I research. saw the bobblehead stuff you guys talked about. I mean, this is. Do a little bit of extra work. Yeah. Now you can get twenty percent. You know, when we do a fully customized, totally bespoke. What's the craziest? like package drop mail drop you guys have done or what's like uh i don't know if there's anything you know that crazy i mean the you know uh, there's one that's sort of memorable you know the team there's a, a i don't even forget remember the company but we were getting good engagement from like mid-level people yeah they were coming they were talking you know whatever but we weren't able to get anything from the cmo okay um her profile on twitter said that she liked Cadbury chocolate and red wine. Um, and so we sent a package to her that had wine, Cadbury chocolate, a copy of my book. Um, and basically it was, I think, Cadbury and wine for five minutes of your time, mm -hmm. you know, um, which worked. She <laughs> responded and said, okay, you know, you got me. I'll take the meeting. Yeah. Um, another fun one. This is just a creative SDR. Yeah. Uh, so one of our sales development reps, his girlfriend's a singer. Right. So he had her write and customize a song um, wow. about for this prospect. You know, um, he recorded it. He sent that to her. He's like, OK, I'll, I'll take the meeting. I'll take the meeting. Yeah. So there's 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 thing I call these like cute, you know, cutesy things you can do. Yeah. Uh, where to stand out, par, you know, partly just because people know it doesn't scale. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. you know, great. Uh, we, had, we had a, co a company that all they did was they would send people their names spelled out in, cra in scrabble letters mm -hmm. right which wasn't fancy but again people know like that doesn't scale yeah you know somebody had to do that all that said i mean the qc stuff is nice um what's even better is commercial insight unpack uh, that you know and so if if you you've, i'm sure you've seen the challenger sale you know the, what do the best sales people do they they teach their prospects something in a way that's that's tailored to their specific business and industry mm -hmm. okay we need to try to do the same thing in our marketing and our prospecting. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we actually, as part of our prospecting this account, we educate them know, in a way that gets them wanting tell, to. You know, so ITS, I made this study. They said that 75% of executives would respond to an unsolicited marketing outreach if it contained ideas that are relevant to their business. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's what we have to aspire to. Um, it's a challenge. It's hard, right? We're engaged, you, and I have to keep pushing my team. Yeah. Like, where's the commercial insight? Where's the commercial insight? Yeah. Um, but I think that's that's the holy grail. And of, to do that, do site. you try to find accounts and group them together that say these are probably the challenges they're facing? So let's do a custom piece of content, c personalize it, but we know it's going to land because they all see that's it. A, that's a great best practice. Yeah. Um, I mean, as a rough, rough rule of thumb, I mean, this is really, really rough. If you're doing seven figure deals mm -hmm. and higher, right? For those, just go totally bespoke. Okay. Right. Research the hell out of Seven that account. Figures, <laughs> one to one. And create custom something for that account. Yeah. Strategic outreach. Yeah. yeah. If you're doing six figure deals, um, two fifty or whatever, group them into micro segments. Yeah. Research the hell out of the micro segment to create something that's really commercially insightful. And then lightly customize it. Yeah. You know, for each one. If you're doing high five figure deals. Um, so 70,000, 60,000 or whatever, that's where, you know, you just, you can't do that quite that same level of, of customization. Um, at least try to go to the persona level. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and still personalize, you know, dear Frank Cadbury and wine. Yeah. Um, and at that, at that level, but it's a little hard to go much deeper than that at that price point. That's and and when you guys do ROI calculations for your, your customers, how do they think of account-based marketing and how much they should spend in that well, activity? We try to encourage people not to think of it that way because mm -hmm. we try to not have people think of account-based marketing as a campaign, mm -hmm. right? It's not. Account-based marketing is a way of running your sales and marketing engine. Right, that has tactics kind of beneath beneath the hood. Yeah. Um, you know what we what we try to you know, work with our customers on is at the end of the day, 
you do have a constrained marketing budget and you have to decide where you're spending those dollars uh, or investing those dollars. Um, so very often people will do some kind of multi-touch attribution, you know, which is, all right, here's a deal we created that's worth a hundred thousand dollars. You know, simplest thing might be like, well, what were the four campaigns that contributed to that, 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 that touched that deal before we closed it? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's give each one $25,000, right? That's a simple form of multi-touch attribution. Yeah. We think that's a little simplistic for ABM, mm -hmm. right? Because it's very much um, the baton handoff model where it's just marketing's job to create the, the, the opportunity. Yeah. And in an ABM world, soccer team passing the ball, you know, you have to look at the marketing touches and the sales touches that influence the account on its way towards the outcome you're looking for. Yeah. That's where those minutes I talked about earlier actually help, right? Because, you know, you need some way to say how much credit are you going to give to each thing. Yeah. Right. So, sure, they attended the webinar, 30 minutes. Yeah. Sales spoke to them for an hour, 60 minutes. Yeah. When you're allocating the deal... Maybe you should give twice as much to the hour sales meeting than to the 30-minute webinar. And what that lets our clients do is it lets them really look at not just the impact of the marketing, but the relative impact of marketing and sales. Yeah. Start to think about, hmm, maybe I should not do that trade show. Maybe I should hire another SDR. Yeah, to do a little bit more personal. Yeah. You know, for example. But yeah. you, it's important to kind of look at the marketing and sales touches together. And then what's your th – do you guys support the bow tie approach to kind of like – you know, selling po past the sale of engaging these accounts to expand. Yeah, I mean, so that's sort of a key, you know, part of of, of the trends here. Um, you know, so in our own, for example, custom funnel, after customer, we have expansion target, expansion opportunity, expansion one, mm -hmm. um, and then it kind of loop back around. The trick that where most companies find this challenging is to start to Think about it not just at the account level, but at the buying center level, mm -hmm. um, and really understand uh, the opportunities around different kinds of product categories. Because mm -hmm. usually expansion is you're selling with well, one of two modes. You know, so at, after the sale, yeah, you're usually either selling an additional product to the same people, mm -hmm. or perhaps the same product or a different product to different people. The, yeah, department. Yeah. Uh, and so you need to look at the account in a little bit more subtle level. You can't just say, you know, this account is an expansion target. You have to say, huh, this group of people are engaging with campaigns or content about this product. Mm. You know, and so that's a, a, an expansion opportunity around into that into particular that demand unit. Yeah. And then you might have a totally different buying center. That's at a different stage of their journey for a different product, so it's a you have to almost double click down one level to understand kind of those those different dynamics. You know, after the sale, um, so we can do that. You know, we we our customers can look at you know heat maps of the account by persona and by product and see so kind of crazy. where they need to kind of be connecting. Um, yeah. The honest truth is that's pretty cutting edge. Most yeah. most clients haven't gotten the operational sophistication yet. Yeah, to be really good at managing that process at that side, but as as, as it's SaaS, inevitable. Yeah, I mean, as SaaS matures, that's really where, as you mentioned earlier, the uh, the opportunity is going to be in the revenue retention and expansion. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I like to say, you know, before Marketo came along, people thought of marketing as the team that made color brochures and threw parties. Yeah. Right, and then Marketo came along, and it's ilk, and we marketing got to reinvent itself as the owner of the top end of the revenue engine. Yeah. Which is cool. Made a lot more credit. You know, CMOs yeah. had a lot more credibility in the boardroom. Yeah, it's time for that role of marketing to be rethought again, where it's not just about generating the new business pipeline, but you know, marketing really is the kind of almost orchestrated the customer experience. Yeah, uh, including cross sell expansion, retention, and so on to existing accounts. Yeah. Yeah, so that's going to be. I, I mean, that's I, what they're doing. They're essentially bringing awareness to the product because as your product evolves, you have current customers who may not be aware of the capacity or capabilities, and you want somebody to be thinking about introducing that to yeah, your existing not customers, just, not just not net just new your customers. CSM because yeah. what happened. That's like having your salespeople do all their own. Yeah, you know everything by themselves. Yeah, I mean, market marketing should play a role there. And like, you're in it, so you, you know you think it's normal. But like, what are some of the cutting edge? 
um, you know, pixelation, remarketing, um, like what is ha- what are people doing from an experience point of view that's really borderline not creepy, but you know what I mean? Like, cause I mean, if I search on a site and then all of a sudden, you know, that there's intent, all of a sudden I'm seeing ads on LinkedIn. Like, is there other stuff that people are doing that is in that in regards to try to bring awareness to, um, a, like to a product? Like, yeah. I mean, I guess a couple things, you know, first of all, I'll say, I'll say there's no, there's no single magic bullet. Mm-hmm. Um, second, some good line I don't have exactly right, but like marketers will all glom on to any tactic that works in volumes that will eventually ruin it. Yeah. We re ruin everything. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, great. Maybe, maybe like right now, direct mail is working pretty well. Yeah. You know, um, everybody else is going to start doing direct mail. And the next thing we're gonna know, it's we're going to be like anymore. overwhelmed and we're going to have to yeah. find something else. Yeah. Um, I, so that's why I ultimately come back to the most important thing is that getting that sales and marketing team dynamic working, mm-hmm. you know, so that way you can actually reach out to people with a human touch, maybe say something personalized and relevant, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, you'll figure out the channel to do that if you get the underlying team dynamic working. What about the amount of uh, education customers are having when they show up even in the sales pipeline? Cause like, I, I mean, that's one thing I've noticed even the way we buy now with my team. Yeah. Like by the time we're doing a product demo, we've already we've researched, looked at the reviews, talked to people, and we're kind of doing a demo is almost like a check and balance to make sure it actually does what it says it does. Mm-hmm. Um, how has that impacted the um, the sales process or, you know, opportunity sizing and, and pipeline? Um, well, you know, in general, I think the desire to kind of do that self-service is a bit of an inhibitor on your classic sales prospecting. Mm-hmm. Right, because people generally don't want to talk to the salesperson um, until they have reached a certain level of their buying process. Yeah. Right. So the question is: Is that just antithetical to everything I'm preaching here, which is kind of getting the human interaction, all that kind of thing? The difference, I think, has to do with the quality of the outreach. You know, i.e., if as a salesperson you're just like, "Hi, I'm John from Engageo, and we sell B2B marketing engagement software. Are you interested? Are you free Tuesday?" Versus competitive insight. You know, yeah. Like, if, if that's all you're doing, you're screwed. Yeah. You know, but, you know, can you find a way to knock on people's doors who have a real pain, you know, teach them something that helped them realize that that pain exists and that there may be things out there that could actually help them, right? There's still room for that, yeah. even in the you know world of self-service. Now, it gets into complicated measurement things. You know, maybe you do that. And maybe three weeks later, some junior person from that company shows up on your website <laughs> and downloads some content. You know, well, that, I still have gotten sparked by your original executive outreach. Yeah. So you got to understand the kind of the dynamics of it. Um, but I still think there's a there's a place for well thought through provocative uh, outreach around content to to edu- to help educate the customer more than just a sales conversation. Yeah. 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 Um, and that's hard. For, it's, that seems to be hard for a lot of companies. Yeah, to do that at scale. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting because just even the concept of plays per stage, um, and I don't know for your customers, but it sounds like there's there's a creative aspect that needs to be. You know, it's still new. It's early days. You know, you got to help them understand how to think it through um, each type of account. I'm assuming you know SMB mid market enterprise probably have a specific play that is going to work better. Each persona has different things that need to work diff- you know, work differently. Is there any rules of thumb for a certain amount of engagement per stage or touch points? You know, um, I don't, I don't know if there's any one rule of thumb I, I would share. I mean, I like the idea of our, like seven figures. You know, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we we see a couple hundred uh interactions you know with with deals where you know i mean a web visit an email i mean yeah you and you you add all that up it gets into the hundreds wow um so i don't know if kind of you know and people are always looking for like what's the magic thing if i do this and then this and then this i get the opportunity Opportunity, yeah it doesn't doesn't work that way like that no and and what have you learned second time around i think you've raised 36 million so far um in two rounds a and b um 
what's what's been the new learning around deploying capital in the business? Yeah, I mean, coming off of Marketo, I had the luxury. It was very easy to raise capital. Yeah, um, which at the time felt great, especially considering how hard it would have been to raise money at Marketo. Yeah. Um, I think I made a classic mistake, to be honest, that a lot of people make, which is really easy to raise capital. I probably overraised. Yeah. Um, and I raised into like the peak of inflated expectations. So the lesson is like, damn, that's hard. You know, like if you if you even if you can raise it that premium valuation, should you means you're priced for perfection. Um, and you know what? I'd like to think I'm pretty damn good, but nobody's perfect. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, and then as a founder, one question I like to ask as we wrap up is. You know, a lot of it is about leadership and and trying to you know develop who we are. Who who did you need to become, John, to lead the company at this scale? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the biggest challenge I try to work on to is my own development as a leader is to kind of bring the inspiration and the positivity. You know, I'm personally a like optimistic, happy person. Uh, but I'm always focused on execution and climbing the hill and, you know, doing things better. Um, I'll, I'll find every typo, every flaw, every problem in what we're doing, which is a good set of attributes. It kind of helps us kind of raise our game. I've had to learn to, you know, stop, thank the team for what's awesome, recognize kind of all the amazing things that are going on, you know, take a breath. And then I can say, and here's the next hill we need to climb. But acknowledge kind of the find the good in what we have yeah. uh, first. Catch people and, doing good things. And celebrate that. It, that doesn't come natural to me. It's something I've had to work on to, to be more deliberate about. I think most founders struggle with that. That's awesome. John, where do people find you and tell them about the book? Um, yeah, where do people follow along? Yeah, so, you know, um, engageo.com is the site. And, you know, engageo.com slash guide. Uh, you can download my book all about account-based marketing. Mm -hmm. It's like 170 pages, but it's a fast read, so... Uh, I do recommend it. Um, and I'm John at Engage You. So. Awesome. John, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Cheers, man. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching this episode of Escape Velocity. Be sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment with your biggest insight from our conversation. Be sure to check out the next episode.